and welcome back to the Granite State Debates and the second congressional district with the nominees, Democrat Maggie Goodlander and Republican Lily Tong-Williams. We're going to jump right back into the questions, starting with Ariel Metropolis. Ms. Tong-Williams, we have a question for you first. There has been some lack of clarity regarding your position about what happened back in 2020 and 2021 when it came to the peaceful transfer of power. Can you please tonight clarify for voters at home did President Joe Biden win the 2020 election and was it a free and fair election? I have said before, we have a President Biden as in the White House and he won the election, he was certified and uh, but some people had questions about our elections. There are some questionable evidence to suggest our federal government censored during pandemic the COVID-19 information, and including Hunter Biden laptop information. Facebook CEO come out to say that. Lots of people were censored when canceled. Because of that, so 2020 election, how do you call that 100%? No question asked. So people had the questions, they were upset, and they want to protest it. But I have said that again and again, that we need to move forward, and Biden is our president. But his disasters four years is not good for our country, for our people. I hope people realize that and I hope we change the direction of this country. But to be clear, do you believe that the election in 2020 was fair and f free? Well, that uh, I always say this, I do not know. I can tell people when I don't know something, I tell you the truth, I don't know. I'm not God, I'm not angel, I don't pretend I know everything. I had the questions myself, but once we move on, Biden is the president, then you know we um, start to look at our country moving forward. But uh, you cannot call people, even look at Hillary Clinton challenge 26 elections, many times I remember on TV, people are allowed to question and to answer and take, you know, like we just cannot pretend we know everything. So when I say Mr. I don't Williams. know, I'm honestly tell you, I don't know, That's I right. just had the questions. Ms. Goodlander. May I just say something? These are not legitimate questions. These are conspiracy theories at this point that have been debunked by federal courts all across this country. These are not serious questions, and it is dangerous to our democracy to continue to spread these conspiracy theories. These questions were asked and they were answered by courts of law. They were answered by Congress. Anyone who casts doubt on the peaceful transfer of power and on the legitimacy of the votes of the American people and the people of New Hampshire has no business running for Congress you or know, serving in the people's house. You know what, I know you taught constitution, we are constitutional republic. We are not a democracy. We have a representative democratic government, which actually when you talk about censorship, when you talk about weaponized government, when you talk about labeling another side extreme instead of have a concert conversations, it's not democratic at all. Don't use the word democracy to shut people down. Even former Democrat, RFK, Tulsi Gabbard were censored and shut down. Censorship from the federal government, from Biden administration, you're part of it, from DOJ, actually should have come out clean to say, why did they censor people? Why you are not Mr. capable Williams. to have a democratic conversations? The right to vote is the right from which all of our rights flow. And it is so essential that anyone who is seeking a, an office of public trust in this country respects the will of the voters and respects our democracy. The outcomes, the legitimate outcomes of elections, including and especially when they don't go your way. You know, this is so core to who we are as a country. It's so core to our constitution. And these conspiracy theories have absolutely no place in this debate or in any debate, because these are the conspiracy theories that people are advancing to try to divide us. Well, Ms. Goodlander, we do have another we're question going to for take you. Another quick question. You took part in the historic first impeachment of former President Donald Trump over his phone call to Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky. What do you say to Republican and independent Granite State voters who view these proceedings and your role in them as overtly partisan in attempting to hurt former President Trump's re-election bid at the time? You know, every time I have taken the oath to support and protect our Constitution, I've done it many times in the Navy, at the Justice Department, in the White House, and when I've served in both 
houses of our Congress. I believe deeply in our Constitution, and I was proud to be a part of this team because it was about enforcing our Constitution. And we worked on a bipartisan basis in the House and in the Senate on this case. It was a case that took a lot of time and effort. It was built with thousands and thousands of pages of documentation and evidence. It was also built on a very careful study of our Constitution and of the constitutional grounds for presidential impeachment. This was a process that was taken very seriously, um, and it's one that was about enforcing our Constitution. And that is, that is why I was proud to be a part of it. And Next. this case, I should say, was also, at bottom, about pr protecting the integrity of our election. Next question from Steve Botori. Ms. Goodlender, this week you described the Inflation Reduction Act as the, quote, single most consequential piece of climate legislation passed by any country ever, unquote. A recent Goldman Sachs report finds that the green energy subsidies uh, in it will actually cost three times what the law supporters initially claimed. So it's going to be about $1.2 trillion. Are you concerned that this increase will in lead to increased inflation and thus the cost of energy for everyday granite staters will increase? Well, let me just say, stepping back for a minute, you know, this is another really big point of disagreement between me and my opponent. Um, I take the climate crisis very seriously. It's not enough in 2024 to just acknowledge that climate change is real. This is, this is an existential crisis that the Department of Defense has said for more than a decade is a threat to our national security. So the way I see this, Steve, is look, the, the Inflation Reduction Act was a really important step towards a, a responsible transition to a clean energy future. And that's going to do two really important things for the state of New Hampshire. Number one, it's going to help us lower our energy costs. We have some of the highest energy costs in the United States of America today here in New Hampshire. And we've got to look towards reliable, clean solutions that, we're going to be, that are going to take us into the future. I'd, I'd also say that this is, this is something that's going to create jobs in the state. I was up in Groveton last week and had a chance to visit the site that used to be the paper mill that was the beating heart of that community. It was a paper mill that closed down in 2007 and 300 people lost their jobs. Today it is the site of a company called Q Hydrogen, which is going to help take us into a clean it's energy future and create good paying jobs right here in New Hampshire, in our North Country. Uh, Ms. Tong Williams, you've criticized what you call the top down response so far when it comes to the federal government's role in fighting climate change. Uh, do you believe that the climate is changing in ways that is impacting people's lives and that there should be government intervention? Well, climate change is real. I don't like top down, for example. And the Inflation Reduction Act, Green New Deal, it did not reduce in uh, inflation, it increased it. Plus, that all Democrats voted on the party night for that bill, it actually took so like an, our Medicare money to go support their projects in Green New Deal, including Biden pro-China economic policies. If Chinese state enterprises want to team up with some so-called American companies to come here to build a battery factory, solar panels, then we give them our tax subsidy money. That's a taxpayer's money. People might not know. Go to foreign country that is not friendly towards us. So either Biden and your economic Green New Deal policies, pro-China, we pro-American workers, and give them the credit. And they are building factory now in Michigan. I have come out against it. And I call out this move Medicare money to go to pay their pet project and Green New Deal and a huge amount of money they spend and give to the foreign government. Ms. Goodlander, you have 30 seconds to respond. Just to clarify, I mean, this, look, what you just invoked the Medicare provisions of the IRA, which were incredibly important provisions that have lowered the cost of prescription drugs for so many people across our state and across our country. You opposed this bill, but what this bill has done, it's capped the cost of insulin at $35. It used to be, you know, I was talking to uh, a man in the in the Upper Valley not too long ago, $400 for the price of insulin. It's now capped at $35. It's also given Medicare the power to negotiate drug prices, which has saved the American people billions and billions of dollars and has actually made prescription later. drugs more affordable. That's time. Next question from Ariel Metropolis. For the first time in our nation's history, the U.S. government is spending more on debt interest payments than on national defense. Over the next decade, net interest payments are estimated at nearly 
13 trillion dollars. This is a much bigger problem than finding inefficiencies and eliminating waste. So please be specific here. Where do you cut? Ms. Goodlander, we'll start with you on this. Well, look, this is, this is an issue for the next Congress that's going to be front and center. We have got to get our fiscal house in order. And we've made some progress. Just last year, President Biden signed into law the most significant measure to reduce our debt and deficit that's been passed in more than a dozen years. We've got to build on this. And my view is very different from my opponents. My view is that th there are two basic elements to this. Number one, uh, we've got to find responsible ways to reduce spending. And let me give you one specific example. I believe that it is past time for Congress to stop giving away massive subsidies, billions and billions of dollars to big oil companies that's costing the American people and that could reduce our debt and deficit um, if we got serious about this. You know, I, I believe that you got to go to the core of a problem. And this, to me, is, is a really promising set of solutions that I will fight for in Congress. Ms. Tong Williams, the same question to you. Where would you cut? Freeze federal hirings. And uh, Rand Powell has a plan called a six penny. He used to have one penny plan. For every dollar federal budget, you cut one penny. When your family is struggling in debt and you have to cut expenses, when I got laid off, I cut my family expenses 20%. Our federal government could not cut one penny out of one dollar and keep printing money, drive by inflation. He can, she cannot tell you, or Biden cannot tell you where they want to cut. They just kick can down the road. It's so sad to see our young people tell me they feel like they have no shot at their American dream. My campaign slogan is about save our American dream for all our children and grandchildren. If you cannot afford anything, government can give you free stuff here, $1, $2, but the inflation up is you know, a lot more. So you don't have net gain, your net income is going down. And the national debt keep growing. That means inflation will even shoot up even higher if we don't cut the government right now. Stick to six penny plan. We'll see how many people from Democrat side will come out Ms. to Tung support Williams. that. Let's turn to foreign policy. Ms. Tong Williams, you said you'd be hesitant to support more financial aid for Ukraine in its ongoing war with Russia, partly because you wonder where the path to victory really is. To be clear, in Congress, are you a no vote on any future funding for Ukraine? I have been saying that for three years now, almost three years, so much being spent, so many people died, and where's the path to victory? Where did the money go? And how can we afford it? It's like, how do we pay for it? We're talking about national debt reduction and the six penny plan for our federal government budget. At the same time, we're gonna to continue to talk about Ukraine money. On my campaign trail, I can tell you, 95% of people tell me, Lily, we need more money in our district. We need the mental health, we need the rehab centers, we need the maybe senior workers, and, and the, we really don't care about what's going on in other countries right now. I mean, if all the people support that, I urge you to donate. There are lots of billionaires, rich people, and maybe we'll be able to donate some money to Ukrainians and to fight the, 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 you know, the tyranny, the aggression, but for our people, they tell me, we need our resources here. I will put our people first. So that's a no vote. Ms. Goodlander, the White House recently said that the United States will provide Ukraine with the support it needs to win this war. Should the country continue to pour money into a war in Ukraine if the outcome is so questionable? And should that support be indefinite? Well, first of all, I just want to point out my opponent's solution here is to hurt hardworking people. She wants to freeze federal hiring altogether. Uh, which is going to hurt hardworking people all across the state and our country. There are other solutions, and this is why we see the world and our economy very differently. I want to help hardworking people. I want a tax cut for the middle class. And I want solutions that are going to ensure that we've got a country, a tax code, and a way of spending that ensures that everyone is paying their fair share in a deeply American principle. But to the point about Ukraine, I think we must have been traveling around different districts because as I've traveled around this state, from my neighborhood in Nashua all the way up to the North Country, I see Ukrainian flags everywhere I go. The people of New Hampshire understand that this is a fight for freedom and it's a fight for democracy. This is an unjust war that Vladimir Putin waged against a sovereign nation. My opponent believes that the path to peace is through Vladimir Putin. I know from my own professional experience that that is just so dead wrong. You know, you know early what? in my career, 
If I could finish, please. Early in my career, I worked for Senator John McCain to take on Vladimir Putin. I'm banned from Russia for life because of that work. And I believe deeply in the cause of freedom in Ukraine. Ms. Tong Williams, 30 seconds. You math cannot add up, okay? And I'm very good with math. Maybe that's stereotype for aging Americans. If you want to pay all the stuff you want to pay, then do your math. How are we going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. Show me the path. Borrow money from China or print money to drive up inflation. And uh, you say Ukrainian flag everywhere in Nashua. I have not seen that many. As I said, if Democrats want to do this, billionaires want to do this, neocons want to do this, please do. Don't let your own money. So many people have died. It's time to bring peace and talk to the table. President Trump is talking about he will be for peace deals as soon as he gets elected. We He's cannot always. afford to engage in endless wars. And your husband, Jake Sullivan, national security advisor, is causing the world on fire because he's incompetent. He should get fired. Ms. Goodlander, 30 seconds. Again, my opponent is focused on me, and I would appreciate if we could stick to the issues and not personal attacks. Policies, but I'm focused policies. on... I'm focused on the issues, and this is a real point of your disagreement. Your mess does not add up. There's an issue is your mess does not well, add up. Ms. Tong Williams, let her finish. This is a real point of disagreement between the two of us. You know, I was really proud to serve for 11 years as an intelligence officer in the Navy Reserve, and one of the things I saw was just how important it is for us to be strong in the face of threats to freedom and democracy around the world. And this is one example where the path to peace does not run through Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump. You know what, I have to say something. Have... Democrat Party has become Ms. party of wars. What happened in the past? Anti-war movement in we the We want to 60s. get to many more questions. So let's, just... let's turn to Steve Botari. We're going to continue on foreign policy. Uh, Ms. Goodlander, as the war in Gaza continues after the October 7th terror attack, so do the calls by some in your party to end American support because of the tens of thousands of Palestinian civilians who have been killed. You have said, when it comes to questions about whether a nation state has committed a war crime, those judgments are made by prosecutors and by investigators, not by congressional candidates. But as someone who would vote on further aid to Israel, what is your assessment about Israel's actions in Gaza, and should Americans' aid continue no matter what? Look, I, I believe that Israel has a right to defend itself. It has a right to exist, and we shouldn't have to say that. But, you know, October 7th was the deadliest attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust. Israel has a right to defend itself, and in Congress, I will fight to make sure that Israel has the resources it needs to defend itself against its enemies, because I believe that Israel's enemies, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, and Iranian-backed groups are America's enemies. This is an investment in our own national security. But look, Israel is also a democracy that has a responsibility to protect the lives of innocent civilians. So as I've said, I believe deeply that the path forward here is number one, to bring about the state that we had before October 7th, which was a ceasefire, a return of the hostages that have been kept in brutal captivity in Gaza for over a year now, and a surge in humanitarian assistance into Gaza, because no one should go without food or water or medical care. And this is a responsibility that the United States and Israel have to the people of Gaza. Ms. Tong Williams, you've expressed your strong support for Israel, but also say the U.S. needs to ask, like you've discussed in the previous question, how we're going to pay for that support. Do you want to stop sending military or financial aid to Israel? And if so, what would persuade you? Morally, diplomatically, and uh, as an ally, we support Israel. I do. And uh, it's only democracy in the Middle East, and it's Americans' best interest and to keep Israel free and democratic. President Trump actually broke several peace deals in the Middle East. He was nominated for actually Nobel Peace Prize. Of course, mainstream media will not report that. And uh, right before Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel reached peace deals and uh, Hamas attacked Israel, think about who is behind that attack. How did Hamas get all this money? Iran. And guess who gave billions of dollars to Iran, enabled them to buy hundreds of billions of dollars, actually sell hundreds of millions of dollars, oil to China, thanks to our national security advisor who runs our foreign policy. So we need to come up. We support Israel, 
But uh, when it comes to money-wise, and uh, we need to have smarter, effective foreign policies. Next question from Ariel Metropolis. The U.S. armed forces are facing a recruitment shortage. Three out of the four major branches fail to hit their recruitment numbers. Today's active duty army is the smallest force it's been since 1940. Something that members of both parties have brought up is that potential recruits who have passed diagnoses of depression, anxiety, or other disorders can be disqualified, and this affects the pool of eligible applicants. Would you support legislation allowing recruits to seek waivers if they've had treatment for mental health? Ms. Tong Williams, we'll start with you on this one. I'm proud to say I have two sons who are veterans, and uh, I have three wonderful children all come out to uh, endorse their mom and uh, vouch for her character, perseverance, and patriotism. And uh, the recruiting efforts in Stout, I think uh, to do with today's military that uh, we have been focused on um, other social nearing stuff. DEI, they are doing that in the military, and also that uh, vaccine mandate during pandemic, nobody wants to join military. Our military has been politicized, and, and that's why people don't want to join. And all those young men who want to serve their country, I met some of them in Conquer after high school, they say they don't want to join because it's a war military and they have to take the COVID shot. So I hope that as a Congress, a woman in the uh, DC, I want to focus on military's mission instead of uh, those social issues inside of our military. Ms. Goodlander, the same question to you. Well, thank you for that important question, Ariel. This is, this is an important question. As someone who proudly served in the United States Navy Reserve, I know how important it is for people to come together in Congress, Republicans and Democrats, to fulfill what we have is a sacred obligation to our veterans and our service members. And what I saw when I worked for Senator John McCain was that he was always willing to reach across the aisle and work with people of any party, Democrats or Republicans, independents alike, to make sure that we are providing and living up to the sacred obligation we have to our service members and to, the, to each branch of our military. Um, we see this very differently. My experience tells me that the people of the United States of America are the most patriotic people especially people who have taken the oath to serve and protect our, our Constitution in the military. So I would want to take a close look at this proposal, and I believe it is a proposal that would fall in line with a lot of the kind of bipartisan work that we've seen from the United States Congress to protect our service members and our veterans. All right, we're going to do a final question before we hit closing statements. This is a 30-second each answer. Now, America has fallen into a bit of a troubling pattern in which more and more people seem to define their own well-being based on who is the president of the United States. You can count on it on Tuesday. No matter who wins, a significant portion of the country is going to be angry and afraid. So what can you do, Ms. Goodlander, to try to alleviate some of that fear and anger in this country? You know, look, the beauty of our Constitution is that we have a system of checks and balances, co-equal branches of government that all operate together. And the Congress is an, a co-equal branch and a separate branch. And it's a branch that if I am honored to serve this, this state in the People's House, I will work to be a representative for everyone, whether you voted for me or not. And that is the spirit that each of us should bring to this work, because this is public service and this is about representation at bottom. And so I can promise you, Adam, and to all of your viewers out there, that this is the spirit I will bring to this work. Ms. Tong Williams, how do you alleviate some of that fear and anger that's out there in this country? Well, when your former boss six months ago come out to call all Trump supporters are garbage, and that's like a half the country become garbage, that's not unifying and positive. And uh, it's been going on for a while. Your boss is the most divisive president since I come to this country. Talk about white supremacy. I mean, you are white. Lots of people are white. And talk about mega Republicans are threats to democracy. You know, all those rhetorics do not help. I like to talk about American dream, how happy I'm here, how much I love this country. I want to serve the people. That's something we should focus on. We've hit time for closing statements. First to you, Lily Tong Williams. Well, it is an American dream for me to be here. I know I'm the underdog in this race, but I trust the people to decide after tonight. I am an independent-minded, illegal immigrant come here to live under freedom and prosperity. 
I'm the embodiment of that American dream. I want to make sure we save it. It's worth saving for. You have a serious choice to make today. Do you want somebody truly represent the people? Or you want somebody from DC swamp? Do you want somebody to tell you the truth, even though she has to stand alone to say no? Or you want somebody that's going to repeat her party's talking points? Do you want somebody who will put our citizen interest first and to really show compassion and the sympathy towards the daily struggles? Or you want somebody who was born with silver spoon, had no idea how the regular people economically and mentally struggling with daily life? I'm asking for your vote. I will always have Ms. town halls. I will represent you with pride and transparency. That's time. Thank you. Ms. Goodlander, one minute. Well, thanks so much to WMUR for hosting us tonight for this important debate. You know, I, I love this state. It made me who I am today. I love our country and I love our constitution. I have taken the oath to protect and defend our constitution many times throughout my life. When I went to serve in the Navy, when I went to the Department of Justice, when I went to the White House to lead the unity agenda dedicated to the basic idea, it might sound old fashioned, but I think it's an idea for the future, that we can still come together as Democrats and Republicans to tackle the challenges that unite us as Americans. And that's what I've done. On the front lines of the fight against some of the biggest drivers of high costs for people across this state and to protect freedom and democracy. These are the things I believe in. It would be the honor of my lifetime to represent New Hampshire in the People's House. And for the next five days and tonight, I'm gonna to work really hard to earn every single vote. I ask for your vote. And what I can promise you is that I will never stop working to deliver for you and to unite this country and the state. Thank you to the candidates for being here tonight. Thank you all at home for watching. Have a good night.